All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I know the if you're if you were in the nine o'clock service across the street, it was running a little late because we had the Daughters of the King induction during the service, so that kind of spread things out. So I think people are just starting to grab their coffee, and we'll get some stragglers coming in. But I wanted to give uh, our guest speaker the full amount of time to talk. Um, so uh, honored and privileged to have Lisa Lefko with us today. Lisa is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Collier County. And um, if you're like me and you grew up with some sort of connection with Habitat, maybe you've been to some bill days or whatever uh, in the North, like where I'm from the Northeast, this is not your everyday Habitat affiliate. Um, I remember doing, you know, we maybe we would get one house done every couple of years or something. Um, but this Collier County's affiliate is, I think the largest in the country as far as, um, as far as the amount of output they do, they do typically about a hundred houses a year. She's gonna tell you all the wonderful information, but I was pleasantly surprised when I came here and Father Edward was taking me around when I first got here to some of our, our partner charities and, and wonderful organizations. And uh, Lisa took us around on a little habit, habit tour and just blown away by the scope and the magnitude of the work that they do. So in this series of stories of service, we wanted to look at things that we're doing sort of in the church in terms of service, but also things in the in the broader community. And so again, we're just honored and privileged to have Lisa here. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Father Nicholas. And thank you, Father Edward. Thank you for the privilege of being here this morning and having a chance to share some stories with you. Um, some of you may know that I'll be back here again. I'm that you know, proverbial bad penny. Um, I'll be back again next week um, at Trinity speaking to the Port Royal Club. Um, so some had asked earlier if this is going to be a, a repeat uh, presentation, and they will be very different. Uh, we're here today to talk about stories of service. And so I'm not going to talk a lot about mechanics. We'll do that on the 30th. Uh, so I invite you, if you uh, want to learn more to put that date on your calendar. I don't know if I actually have the authority to invite you the, to the Port Royal Club Forum, but uh, it's done. Um, so again, thank you for, uh, for having me here this morning. Um, somebody needs to tell me, Father Nicholas, Father Edward, what's our cutoff time? Five minutes after I start? Oh, five minutes. It's a... 11.05, thank you for the translation. Thank you, thank you, great. I just wanna, I, some who know me, the Goebbels know me well, Nick knows me well, Steve knows me well. Uh, I could keep you captive here uh, until about six o'clock tonight, but I understand the good food just came out. So when they're done, we'll just go capture some of that. I wanna share with you uh, a little of our history. Father Nicholas is exactly right. We are the largest producing affiliate of Habitat for Humanity in the United States. We're also one of the oldest affiliates. We're one of the earliest affiliates. Um, we're going to talk about the, the birth of Habitat for Humanity in just a moment, but I want to put this in perspective for you. So in the United States, there are currently about a thousand affiliates or outposts of Habitat for Humanity uh, throughout the country. Uh, each one is locally incorporated and governed by a volunteer board of directors, we do things um, within some basic parameters that Habitat for Humanity has provided for us, but we also have the flexibility to be able to respond to our local context, our local area, and, and the needs of the area. So each affiliate may do things in nuanced ways. So if you're involved in an affiliate somewhere else, uh, you may come with some basic understanding, but you'll find here that things may be uh, slightly different or radically different. And we'll get into some of those things um, as we share the morning together. But let's go back to the, uh, to the beginning of Habitat for Humanity. Uh, the gentleman on the right is our founder. Now, you may not recognize him because as I speak about Habitat's beginnings um, throughout the community, many, maybe most people think that it was another guy that started Habitat for Humanity. Who is that? Jimmy Carter. And of course, Jimmy Carter is absolutely our most famous volunteer. It was the Carters that put 
Habitat for Humanity on the map and made the brand of Habitat a household conversation. But it was actually this guy, Millard Fuller, who began Habitat for Humanity. Let's go back and, and talk about how that happened. By the way, setup. We're gonna talk about stories today. I love to tell stories. And so we're gonna share four or five stories um, uh, that have kind of wrapped Habitat's world together here in Collier County. So Millard uh, was grew up in uh, poverty. He was the child of a single mom, grew up in rural Alabama, and um, was very ambitious. Uh, also very entrepreneurial, which is a word that I have to practice saying over and over again. Um, and so he was very creative in his business uh, holdings. He, as a young man, set a goal of being worth a million dollars by the time he was 30. Now, in the 50s um, and early 60s, that was something, right? And sure enough, after marrying his college sweetheart, uh, establishing a law practice, uh, branching out into a number of subsidiaries, businesses that were thriving, making good money. Uh, his financial planner came to him on his 30th birthday and said, congratulations, Millard, you're worth a million dollars. Now, the flip side of that was that in pursuing all of these um, different businesses, his relationship with his wife had broken. She said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a business widow. Um, and so they uh, now worked to reconcile their marriage. And a pastor sent them to work with the guy on the left, whose name is Clarence Jordan. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Clarence Jordan uh, was Bill, yeah, but, uh, identified himself as a theologian farmer. And um, he wrote the cotton patch versions of the gospel, um, if that's familiar to any of you, kind of taking the gospel and, and uh, paraphrasing it into a vernacular uh, where Jesus grows up in South Georgia, um, so if you can imagine. So uh, Clarence Jordan had long ago, prior to Millard's arrival, established a beautiful retreat center called Koinonia Farm, a place where uh, families could come and live together uh, in, a, in a setting that he felt like was an accurate representation of what he read in the book of Acts, where everybody worked together for the benefit of the entire community. And <laughs> uniquely at Koinonia Farm, Clarence welcomed people of all races. And uh, this became a, a, a flashpoint uh, as uh, the racial tension escalated in the 50s and Ku Klux Klan activities became prominent. Remember, we're talking about rural South Georgia. Um, so it was a very difficult time. Millard came after that uh, period, um, but in working with Clarence, he and his wife, Linda, uh, identified that the thing that had been missing in their lives was a pursuit of what God wanted for them, what, what, uh, what they felt like was their call to their life's work, um, and that instead they had been pursuing this material success and material wealth, wealth uh, worldly uh, possessions. And so they, they uh, agreed to divest of everything. They had several houses, all of these businesses, they sold everything. Um, interestingly enough, their, his Millard's business partner was a man named Morris Deese. Is that a familiar name? Morris Deese went on to take that law office and found the Southern Poverty Law Center. So that, that was the, the direction that, that both of these remarkable men ended up moving in and, and changed and touched the lives of many. So uh, they, Millard and Linda divested of everything, gave their money away, did not, uh, did not give it to Habitat for Humanity because we hadn't been born yet. Uh, but they decided that what moved them the most was the plight of poor families uh, living around this bucolic retreat center. And so they began to pull together partnerships between women and men of faith, the business community, anybody who would see that housing was the, the most important thing for us to get right, 
before we talked about healthcare, or education, or economic development, other things. So this concept of partnership housing was born, um, and they began to build one home uh, near Koinonia Farms. And then soon after that, uh, Millard and Linda were asked to go to Zaire uh, through the church to begin to, to assist families there with, with housing needs. They came back to the United States, and in the early 70s, they took this concept and formalized it and created what they called the Fund for Humanity. Because in this model, built on scriptural principles, remember, uh, Clarence is a theologian, so they're, they're studying not the Wall Street Journal or uh, treatises from the business school at Harvard, but rather uh, they're studying scripture. And out of scripture, they formed this organization where families who had critical need in housing uh, could participate and become a part of their own housing solution through the investment of sweat equity, by making a small down payment, and by repaying the loan for any activity, whether it was renovating, rebuilding, or building new construction uh, in order to achieve their home. Uh, so that model is exactly the model that we uh, that we share today. <clears throat> so 1978, 1976, the Fund for Humanity is established and incorporated. And in 1978, it came to Collier County. <clears throat> and on that same day, three other Habitat affiliates were incorporated. But so... We are one of four of the oldest, but uh, we had a board member who was a member of Trinity uh, who once said, look, uh, that's all well and good, but the sun comes up in Collier County before it does in San Antonio and South Carolina. And so we are, we bill ourselves as the oldest. Um, so st story number one, the story of Millard Fuller. Story number two, the story of Sam Durso. In 1993, <clears throat> Sam Durso and his wife, uh, Marianne, retired to Marco Island. Sam had been a, a dermatologist in Andover, Massachusetts. They uh, sold their um, medical practice at, at young. Sam was in his early 40s when he sold his practice and retired, moved down here. Marianne thought he might walk the beaches and find new patients uh, to attend to. Um, um, Sam had a much different idea. Uh, Sam and Marianne are pictured here in the lower right, a uh, couple here on the other side. Um, that was not what happened. Sam had grown up the son of a, of a carpenter, and which I know a guy, uh, and uh, came out and volunteered, was invited by a friend of his to volunteer at Habitat for Humanity. At that time, we had only been building in Immokalee. Um, and so celebrating our 15th anniversary, Sam and his friend Dick Rulo volunteered to do the day that they did the layouts of the 100th house. Um, so that was his first experience. He was absolutely hooked not so much on the idea of the way that we were serving families, but he just liked to be covered in sawdust. And so Sam um, got more and more involved. The more he heard about the story, the more it captured his heart and his spirit. Marianne, um, again, having recently retired, but wanting to be actively engaged in the community, had gotten very involved in guardian ad litem and uh, was particularly active in the Immokalee community. So the more Sam talked to Marianne about what Habitat did and what he was learning about this remarkable model, the more she got interested and involved. And finally, uh, not long after that first day of Sam volunteering on a cold January day in 1993, the two of them took the roles of full-time volunteer leadership. By the end of the year, Sam was a member of our board of directors. In 1999, he became chairman of the board and uh, remained so until his passing in 2017. Um, just a, a, an incredibly committed couple. They did more 
to elevate Habitat's work here uh, than ever had been done and ever will be done um, during their term of service. So Sam came into an active organization. We were building about 20 houses a year, which is still a large number for a Habitat for Humanity affiliate. So let's go back and talk about those 1,000 affiliates. Um, there are only 45 affiliates today that are building more than 12 houses a year. So back in 1993, 20 houses a year was a, was a big number. Um, so of those 45, uh, tw uh, building more than 12 houses a year, of course, we're at the top of the leaderboard um, with our closings averaging between 80 and, and 100 houses a year. And we've been doing that for 24 years. Um, so Sam and Marianne come in, become involved, uh, learn more about the organization, um, and begin to ask really good, hard questions. Like, why are we only building in Immokalee when the service industry is, uh, is here in, in Naples? Many people who were living in Immokalee were traveling, you know, 45 minutes uh, and an hour to get to their jobs along the coastal area in Naples, down in Marco Island, um, the Hilton, the Ritz, uh, Naples Grand, these big hotels are sending buses to Immokalee to transport workers back into Naples to come to work. And so Sam and Marianne asked the important question of why are we not building in Naples? And nobody had really considered that before. So sure enough, uh, we began to acquire single lots in a neighborhood called Naples Manor on the south side of Naples, an older neighborhood in a, a rather uh, challenged neighborhood. Lots of transients, lots of um, uh, rental, uh, properties that were poorly maintained, uh, folks going in and out. Um, uh, the, the, the phrase was rent a mattress. So uh, a, a landlord would rent out a unit and uh, there'd be, you know, 15 single guys uh, who were working the farms primarily. Uh, and they'd stack mattresses up and lean them up against the wall in the morning and they'd lie them down in, in the evening and uh, just jam as many people as they could in. Um, so it was a, a challenged neighborhood, but in that neighborhood, we could pick up uh, developed lots ready to build uh, for about $3,000. Um, and so it made it an affordable entry for us to begin building homes here in Naples. Uh, over now those that period of time, 30 years, uh, we've now built more than 350 homes in a neighborhood that has about 1,500 home sites in it. So while we're not a majority, we are a significant minority. And what we saw happen was that uh, the neighborhood began to change, right? People began to take uh, pride in their homes as Habitat home buyers, and now there was more uh, consideration given around neighborhoods, and soon we saw other builders uh, for-profit builders say, hey, I can, uh, I can build a home here and actually make a profit and provide a single family home for a family. So we saw other builders coming in to the point that uh, during the housing boom, 2005 and six, uh, properties in Naples Manor now sold for, remember what I told you we first picked them up for? $3,000. Now they sold for $100,000, that very same lot. So uh, the, the neighborhood really changed and, and uh, became uh, a much more desirable neighborhood. Sam and Marianne's influence cannot be underestimated. Um, they not only brought our building here into Naples, but they had the vision of moving from infill housing, sort of buy a lot, build a house, buy a lot, build a house, buy a lot, build a house, to buying parcels of land and becoming subdivision developers. Um, so we made that shift in 2000 by buying two parcels, one in Immokalee and one in Naples, 
that became our first subdivisions. And today that is our primary method of construction. Uh, we still do some scattered lots, but most of our construction is in a subdivision where we create a neighborhood, put a, a homeowners association in place and uh, have a, a very successful uh, trajectory on its way. I wanna tell you another story. I wanna tell you the story of Hugh McCall. Is that name familiar to anybody? Hugh, yeah. Hugh McCall was the CEO of Bank of America. And when he retired in 2004, he asked not for a golden parachute or a watch or stock options. He asked to build 100 Habitat for Humanity homes across the United States. And we were fortunate to be selected as one of those sites. So Hugh McCall comes to Naples and we have an amazing build day. Bank of America staff are there. Lots of volunteers are out. We were building in Victoria Falls, that first neighborhood. Um, and we built the home of the Gonzalez family, Jose, Maria, and their children, Jose Jr. and Azalea. Uh, Jose Jr. and Azalea were little guys. Um, but I want to tell you what was amazing about that day. That day was one of the days out of many, 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 but a day that, that highlighted what Millard called the theology of the hammer, where people of all different walks of life could come together and whether they agreed on anything else, political, but, but the expression of our faith, our e economic vision, our social status, we all could agree that housing was basic. Housing was fundamental uh, for the success of a family regardless. So here we are all building together and Hugh McCall is in a pair of overalls and he's got a red bandana tied around his, his head. And that guy is outworking everybody else on the site. I mean, he, he was just, he wasn't gonna take a break, wasn't gonna stop. And uh, at one point he is working side by side with Jose and lots of other folks. And the conversation that ensued was so beautiful because neither recognized the other for who they were. Um, and then as we got to a time of sharing and uh, talking about who we all were, uh, it was revealed that this was going to be Jose's home and that here he is working side by side with Hugh McCall. Uh, that theology of Jesus, the, the, the theology of the hammer, uh, rings true today throughout the world of Habitat for Humanity and is one of the things that is the most uh, beautiful result of this important work together. Um, you can see Azalea graduated in uh, the midst of the pandemic, but has gone off to college, is graduating this year. This is their beautiful home now, 20 years later. Uh, by the way, uh, earlier this year, uh, well, just at the end of last year, Jose and Maria made their final payment on their home. Um, so l let me remind you, uh, back to the economics, that uh, Habitat goes from being the builder to the bank at the closing table. So we are the ones who finance the mortgages. Homes are not given away. They're sold but they're sold uniquely with an interest-free loan. Back to those core founding principles. Why is it interest-free? Thank you. Yeah, I shouldn't have let you play. Mark, Mark is a, a, a newly reinvested member of our board of directors. This is his second tour of duty. And I'm so grateful. We've, all, we've had Trinitarians that have been a part of our leadership team as long as I've been here, which is now 20 to 23 years. Um, so thank you to Trinity for being a part of that remarkable leadership. But indeed, it does make it affordable, Nick, you're right. But the reason that we do it is because it says in scripture, when you make a loan to brothers and sisters that have a need, don't charge interest. 
Uh, so we don't. Um, the story of volunteering, which of course Hugh opens the, the book on that, uh, as do Sam and Marianne, uh, has many different manifestations. Many people know about building on our construction site. That's an important part of what we do. Uh, but we also have many other ways of volunteering, teaching classes, uh, serving in our restore as Nan has done, uh, helping to stage and decorate and uh, sell the gently used furniture and home furnishings that are donated by this remarkable community. Um, one last story, the story of dedications. So when we complete a home, uh, we, we do go to the closing table and a mortgage is uh, completed um, and that home now goes into the name of the new home buyers. Uh, they repay the original investment that is made in their lives, which then creates this beautiful recycling of funds, uh, allowing us to continue to build homes. Um, our most important income stream is philanthropy. We absolutely are fully dependent. More than 50% of our revenue comes in from the generosity of this amazing community. Our second most important income stream, about 20% of our income, comes in from mortgage payments. Um, so those, those payments from, from home buyers. But the, and Steve was present at a, at a house closing on Friday, but the closing is, is not nearly as much of a highlight as the dedication. Uh, so once a family closes on their homes, we give them a little bit of time to get settled in, transition from uh, house to home as they settle in and decorate and paint and hang pictures. Um, and then we invite folks to gather together as we bless and dedicate homes and neighborhoods. Um, and we invite donors that have provided the resource to get that virtuous cycle started, volunteers that have participated in building homes and neighborhoods, families, neighbors, anybody who wants to come, uh, to come and be a part of that, of that beautiful time of celebration and prayer. Uh, one of the dedications that, that stands out in my mind uh, was a guy named Muriel Aguirre. Muriel and his uh, wife, well, let me go back and tell you the beginning of Muriel's story, story starts when he was in Nicaragua, where he grew up. He grew up in an affluent family, um, but when his brother was beheaded by the Sandinistas, his parents determined to put him in uh, the car of a coyote that they paid $5,000 to transport him out of Nicaragua and into the United States. Once here, he was granted political refugee status, and he came to Naples, where he started working uh, two jobs. He worked at the Lely uh, Golf Course. He was a greenskeeper by day, and at night, he worked at the Naples Daily News running the presses. And he did that for years to gather enough money to bring his wife and his children legally into the United States. So once they arrived in the United States, uh, Muriel had uh, learned about Habitat for Humanity. And uh, once they were reunited, they, their application was approved and soon they moved into their new home. Uh, Muriel's kids became a part of Champions for Learning and um, the, were uh, uh, afforded an opportunity to go to college, uh, remarkable kids. But at their home dedication, um, they, uh, they single family home in Naples Manor, and they're there with a lot of people that they don't know, a lot of people that don't look anything like them and have lived very different lives. But Muriel stood up in his broken English and he said, I came here and I was a stranger and you made me your brother. That touched my heart so deeply. And other people have said very similar things, other words, but that moment was really powerful and profound for those of us who were there. Um, home dedications are a beautiful time and uh, we celebrate with families. Um, I wanna share with you in these last couple of minutes, um, a short video 
Um, and it will give you a chance to hear from <clears throat> families firsthand uh, how they feel and what has happened because of their partnership with Habitat for Humanity. And then if anybody has questions or wants to talk more, we can hang out and I'll, I, as I said, I, I could stay here until uh, late tonight and uh, never run out of things to, to share and stories to tell. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it
So Mar uh, Mario and Abigail, the 2500th homeowner in Collier County, uh, prior to moving into Whitaker Woods and their new home, they were living in a converted garage. Um, there was no restroom uh, in order to go to the bathroom. They had to leave uh, the garage and go into the main house. Um, so they literally had to go outside and then back inside to get to a toilet facility. Uh, so imagine uh, that while you're pregnant, um, the baby was born prematurely and had several medical issues, and that's what they brought her home to. Um, so the challenge was very real. Uh, the, the story that uh, Sabrina shared a little bit of, um, she had uh, survived a challenging uh, relationship of abuse, uh, got out of that, had finally gotten back up on her feet, were rent, was renting a trailer. The trailer caught on fire. They lost everything. Uh, they moved into a women's shelter. Uh, you heard her say that uh, then they moved to Providence House, which is another remarkable organization locally. The Providence House uh, facility got flooded in Ian. It's over off of um, SD Avenue. And once again, they lost everything. Um, but every time, Sabrina said, it's been a blessing. I've learned something new. So thank you for your patience. Any questions that you have, <clears throat> I'm happy to stay. I know Father Edward has to move along. Father Nicholas, what, what can I help to? At a fourth story, um, because in this world, uh, people and ideas need advocates. Um, and Lisa's words, her authenticity, her energy have helped transform how many lives? Um, so thank you for all that you do. I know that as a leader, you don't often get people saying, oh, you're doing such a great job, but you're an amazing person for Naples and for all these people. So thank you. Thank you. Hang out. Anybody have questions? We're moving to, yeah. With land being so expensive, do you ever stack the homes like two or three floors? You know. Thank you, thank you. So we didn't talk about sort. Of, this is this is the thirtieth. Come back on the thirtieth. We'll talk uh, in about the way that we're building. So these are the three neighborhoods that are currently under construction. All of them are exactly as you have indicated. So we've increased the density so that we can serve more families. And obviously the economics of affordability uh, are, are helped here. So these, uh, the two on the ends are two-story townhome designs. So this is a triplex, that's a quadruplex. And this neighborhood in the middle is just off of Pine Ridge Road called Songbird. And it's a stacked condominium. So it's a unit over a unit. So just exactly as you've said, yeah. Great question. Yeah. Fire approved. Yep, so uh, I just looked at the statistics recently for 2023 and we talked to 2,450 families um, about this program and whether they, they could be approved. Of those, we approved 122 and 92 of them closed on their homes. So some of them were approved late in the year and we haven't closed yet, but they will soon. Um, so that uh, that's kind of the, the ratio of need right now. Um, and of course you think about what, what folks are uh, up against. We were talking earlier with Chris uh, about affordability um, with the average rent in Collier County just being under, being just under $2,400 a month uh, to rent an apartment. Um, you know, on on service industry wages, it's just not possible. Apply again? Yes, folks can always apply again. So when a, when an application is uh, either not approved or uh, you know for some reason it has be, been rejected, we always tell folks how they can um, strengthen their application so that it competes better. And most of the time, it's just paying off debt or increasing savings. Um, but a critical, all, uh, another critical uh, start point is that all members of the family must be 
U.S. citizens or permanent legal residents. So sometimes it's that waiting game of waiting for a spouse like Muriel's wife to gain uh, residency. They can't pay their mortgage. If they can't pay their mortgage. So what, the first thing that you need to know about that is that when we establish the mortgage payment, we make sure that the payment is no more than 30% of their monthly income. So generally folks are, even if they're just getting cost of living raises, they're gonna be making a little bit more, but their, their payment will, will remain affordable outside of you know crazy things like insurance, um, which we're all unfortunately getting- Not that that ever happens. Hit, hit by. Not that that ever happens. Um, but in the event that maybe there's a layoff or an illness, uh, we work very closely with families. We, we really invest a lot in maintaining that, that relationship over the years. We ask families to come into our office in person to make their payments so that we see them and we know when those things are happening before it gets uh, beyond you know, re repair. Uh, so we're able to establish payment plans that, that will help them through that uh, rocky period until they can get uh, back back up on their feet. Mark, you have a question or you're a plant? Is it is it true that less than one half of a percent of the people default on their mortgage? Yes, and in we, fact, mm -hmm. is that also far less than the actual default rate of people in Naples? Oh, yes. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that any bank would uh, want to have our delinquency or foreclosure rate. Uh, so our delinquency, so families that go, you know, past a, a month uh, a payment uh, is less than 5%. So 95% of families are current or even paid in advance. Uh, so one of the things that we uh, encourage families to do, particularly if they're working in a seasonal job, is to use some of their tax return to make their summer payments in advance. So it kind of builds their own safety net. Um, and, and then our foreclosure rate is enviably low. Uh, we just don't have people fail um, in, in their home ownership journey. I'm just curious if they do, do you put the house on the market or do you try to sell it to another Habitat family waiting? Yeah, so that's great. Uh, one, of, one of the things that is built into our mortgage is the right of first refusal. So we're always gonna work to buy a home back when a family wants to sell or has come to a place where they, you know, they're not gonna be able to make the payment. Um, so we're always gonna try to buy that house back. We'll renovate it and bring it up to our like new standard and then we'll sell it to another quali qualified family. Uh, no, uh, we have sold uh, homes to to couples that don't have children. We, to my knowledge, we have never sold a home to a single person. Uh, did I do that? <laughs> um, and and the reason is that because the the process is so competitive, if if we have two applications that are the same. Uh, same income, same debt, same savings, but this is, uh, you know, this is a, a a mature couple with no children. Couple with no children don't have to be mature, I guess. Uh, or, and this is a, a single parent with a child. Who who gets the who gets the house? So the the kids always tip the scale. And we know what happens with when children grow up in a stable home. We get to see that success. I brought some propaganda. <laughs> So if you'd like to read more, um, let me particularly share with you uh, lots of pride over this one. This is our most recent newsletter. Uh, this is Alejandra, who was three when she moved into their Habitat home. Um, she graduated at, at the top of her class from Laley High School with the highest GPA the school had ever seen. She applied to something like 17 colleges and universities, including all of the Ivies got into most of them um, and selected, even though she had a full ride at Harvard, she selected Princeton. Um, so she's at Princeton today. Freezing. <laughs> we also had four years ago, we had the only Collier uh, County um, kid go off to West Point, grew up in a Habitat house. Yeah. 
a couple of professional athletes. I'm not, I'm not very, <laughs> very. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thanks much, for Lisa. all you do. Thank you to Father Edward and Father Nicholas for their leadership and uh, your ongoing partnership. Absolutely.